Well, we're going to dive into the Word of God here today, and God put a word on my heart that could be a topic where many people think, oh, yeah, I've heard about 20 different sermons on this topic. But God gave me a very, very specific direction in what I want to preach on today. So let's open up real quick. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of John. I'm going to chapter 21, and I want to read the uh, first couple verses to you. This is not our main text, so if you just want to follow along, these three verses on the screen, you're more than welcome to do that. But it's going to set the stage for what God put on my heart here this morning. Chapter 21 of the book of John, verse 1 says, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Manifest is a new fun word that's out there in culture. You know, the New Agers and and the social media influencers, it's like, I'm manifesting happiness today, and I'm manifesting this. I'm like, hey, Jesus had that word first, okay? The manifestation of his presence, manifest presence of God. Verse 2, Simon Peter and Thomas called Diddy, Diddy Miss, that's funny, Diddy. And then my Bible, it has a dash and it goes to Diddy Miss, Diddy Miss. And Nathaniel uh, Cana of Galilee and his son Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat and that night caught nothing. Why the heck am I bringing these three verses up? Well, today I want to talk about the will of God. And again, many have heard, many stories have gone to maybe Bible college and have taken courses on God's sovereignty and on his will. And I I read this story here this morning because in some translations, maybe in your translation, when Peter says, I want to go fishing, there's actually an exclamation point there. Now that, you know, fishing is absolutely fun. But what makes this so interesting is that Jesus had just died and they had lost hope that he had risen from the grave. So here you have Jesus who walked life with them for three years and he says, I'm going to die. Everybody listening, I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back in three days. Well, after three days, they lost hope. And isn't it amazing that the human will is so quick to lose hope in God's will that we'll go right back to what is comfortable and what we're used to instead of waiting and trusting on what God said he's going to do. And so today, the will of God, but more so not just being obedient to the will of God, but how God's will can be a motivation and even a comfort to Christians who are going after the impossible. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you that when our hearts are clouded and maybe not clean, maybe when we've been too busy and hurried, maybe when we've been prideful and it seems that your voice is dim and it seems that we're not hearing you clearly, you have left this marvelous account of Holy Spirit-inspired words, the very word of God we can hold in our hand that at any moment, regardless of our situation or our emotions, we can open up the pages of the scriptures and hear your voice clearly. So as we go forth this morning talking about your will, Father, we pray an anointing on the preaching of the word and a study of your scriptures. May you bless each of my friends here, those watching online, even after the fact, with a mighty word from God, a revelation to them personally, and may you help us now as we turn to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. About 10 years ago, there was this cute, funky little movie called Ramona and Beezus. Might have shared this before, but it's a story of this little girl who's very awkward. She's very unique, very creative. Her family, they're all perfect, you know, spot on people. And you have this little oddball in the family. Many of us are the oddball in the family. And so she's constantly feeling like she doesn't belong. Everybody gets great awards. Everybody succeeds at this, that, and the other. And she seems to always mess things up or get into some type of trouble. One day, she's probably eight years old at this time, Uh, decides for herself that she's no longer wanted in her family. So in in this motion of of emotions and and sadness, she grabs a little suitcase and just starts throwing in the teddy bear and the little things because she's decided she's going to run away. Her mom walks into the room and says, what are you doing? And she says, nobody wants me. I'm not good enough. Nobody needs me here. So I'm running away. And the mom says, oh, you're running away. Well, uh, how long are you going to be gone for? And the little girl's kind of like shocked and like, uh, for forever. And, and, you know, she says the statement. She says, oh, well, if you're gone forever, you, you're going to need a, a bigger suitcase. The little girl's like, this is not how you're supposed to react right now. 
So the mom goes and gets a bigger suitcase and she's helping her. And she's like, you know, it's going to get cold. So I got dad's jacket for you. And you're going to brush your teeth every night, right? That's my girl. So she gets a toothpaste and toothbrush, puts it all in there. And then finally packs all the things up and sends the little girl on her way out the sidewalk and on down to wherever her new journey is. And she's pulling behind her this massive suitcase. And she's going block after block after block and tears are streaming down her face. And she seems like I've made a mistake and my family doesn't want me. She stops at a bus stop and sits on this massive suitcase. It's probably heavier than she is. And she hears a little voice inside of the suitcase. And when she opens up the suitcase, she notices that her mom had put heavy weights inside of the suitcase to make her travels just a little bit difficult. And then as she dug in and followed the voice, she found a little walkie talkie. And it was the sound of her family who was just about 20 feet away in their minivan following her every step of the way. So they had this glorious little, you know, reunion. And obviously the movie ended, sorry to kill it for you, ended on a happy note. And when I, I remember this story, God brought it back to my memory this week. How much is that the will of God for our lives? Where sometimes we feel we're not good enough. Sometimes we feel like we've made too many mistakes. And sometimes we feel God doesn't want us. The world doesn't want us. We don't fit in anywhere. And so we go about in our own will to carry out and accomplish what we think we should. And even our own mistakes, even in our own free will, even when we turn our backs to God, he never turns his back to us. And it seems like we can take a bunch of steps away from God, but he's always right there because his will brings safety. His will brings comfort. His will can actually bring security to the believer. And so today I want to bring some clarity and light to God's will in the sense that God's will should not be treated like some wish. Isn't it amazing how many times we pray for something and we say, God, if it be your will, Like we should know what God's will is for our lives and for this world. We shouldn't go to God like maybe if if you're in a good mood, God, if it be your will, can you make this happen? God's will should actually be more so than a wish. It should be the comfort of the believer because we know his heart, we know his will, and we want to follow after him. We can't just say, God, be it your will and have no effort on our part. We can't say, God, your will be done, and then not partner with him in this world. He wants to use men and women who love him to carry out his will on earth. Now, God's will has a lot of definitions, and I always bring my personal conviction and definition of the will of God. And it's pretty simple to me. God's will in in many places in scripture says that God desires that all would come to salvation. Of course, a good and loving father wants to see every human being on the planet come to salvation become a born-again believer, and follow after Jesus to become more like him. We also see in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus makes very clear to his disciples and then also to us. He says, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I say this often, that we should live in a way where the realities of heaven become a reality here. So if there is no sin in heaven, God's will is to see purity in the hearts of his believers. If there is no sorrow in heaven, we should see joy manifested in this world here today. If there's no sickness in heaven, we need to lay hands on the sick and believe that they will recover. So we can partner with God to pull heaven down to this place and see a manifestation of his goodness and of heaven and those realities become a reality here. They are to waken the soul to know what is to come and show a God who absolutely loves them. God's will is the strength and security of the believer. I read the story of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, from a podcast this week. Never heard it before. You may have. Maybe you looked at it on Wikipedia. Not sure. But in 1933, in the middle of the Great Depression, they wanted to build this bridge that went across the Golden Gate Strait in San Francisco. Now, this project was going to cost probably 46, 30 something million dollars, which today would equate to about 500 million dollars to build this bridge. And they put, you know, a certain amount of time for it to be completed. It was going to be almost a mile long, just a massive, the biggest suspension bridge in the world at that time, just an incredible feat. So they calculated everything, but they knew it was risky because from where the bottom of that bridge was going to be to the top of the water was 200 feet. That's some, what, 20 stories? And when you fall 20 stories from that height, even though you splash in some water, it's like hitting concrete. It's no joke. And so they wanted to build a safety net, something that could move with the workers in case any of them fell. They didn't want to lose lives. 
Unfortunately, many lost their lives in the construction, but they were wrestling with this because if they were to put the safety net together, it was probably going to prolong the overall due date of this project. But the people who were running it decided, you know, people's lives are more important than a stinking deadline. So they went ahead and invested the $130,000 to build this net. And praise God they did because 19 men were saved because they fell into that net and not into the waters. Now, the most remarkable thing, though, was that they actually finished not only on time, but they finished early, even though they had a delay building the safety net. And the reason, which is pretty obvious, is you're going to work harder and with more passion when there's no fear of falling. They had a safety net. If there was no safety net, they'd be cautious and slower with every little move. There'd be anxiety and fear with every step of the way. But when there's a safety net, there's no fear of falling. And see, for me, the will of God is not this booming, you better obey voice from heaven. The will of God for me is that God has a plan and God is in control and this world is ugly and evil, but God knows what he's doing. And because God is in charge and I'm not, praise the Lord, that he's in charge, guess what? We can follow after him with total abandon. We can follow him with all of our passion because he's in charge and whatever happens is his will be done. We can follow after him. So the main thing I'm trying to bring across in this message here today, the main thing, is that God's will should not be a wish. God's will should be a weapon in the arsenal of the believer. God's will should be a weapon. Now, God has a plan. And we're on this side of eternity, meaning we're finite human beings that don't have the mind of an infinite God. So sometimes things happen in this world that we don't understand. And praise God, you don't have to. He never gave us the responsibility to figure it all out. Praise God. He called it trust. He calls it faith. He didn't say figure it out. Praise the Lord. But God's plan can be rocky. God's plan can have a process. God's plan is not always easy, but it's always him. And I want to read an account of something that was rocky, but God had a plan all along. So go with me to the gospel of Mark chapter 5. As uh, the Lord brought me to Mark 5 this week, I thought, really, God, how many times have I preached this message? You know, and In my Bible, I only underline in this Bible the messages that I speak at Southgate. So anytime there's a red underline in this Bible, it means I've preached it already or I'm preaching it today. So Mark 5 has been underlined like three times already in the year and a half I've been here. I can't get away from it. And it's amazing that you can go back to the same story in the Bible, the same scripture, and still get something fresh from the well of God. So we're going to Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. We're going to go through about 13 verses here. I'm praying that most of us know the story. This is where uh, Jesus is on the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee and says, we're going to go over there. And over there is the demon-possessed, unkosher, crazy land. And Jesus says, we're going that way. And in the middle of going that way, a hurricane hits them. They fear for their lives, and Jesus calms the storm. Now they're approached with the assignment, which is this demonic-filled man. Verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Genesee. Verse one, I already had a pause. Verse one, it says that they came to the other side of the sea. And it's so funny how the Bible will say one simple little verse and say, oh, they went to the other side. Well, that other side meant a storm. That that other side meant trust. That other side meant we almost lost our lives. But when Jesus is in the boat, when Jesus is with you and you're walking that journey together, You can make it to the other side. And regardless of what's going on, you can have comfort in his plan. So it just starts off saying they went to the other side like it's no big deal. It was a massive deal knowing that they're going into the place of darkness and evil. Sometimes believers are called to go in a place where nobody else has the the courage to go into because we bring an answer. We need to be reminded constantly that we have an answer known as Jesus into a world that has no hope. Verse 2. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling amongst the tombs. That's a sight to see. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and chains had been torn apart by him, and shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs. That'll freak you out a little bit and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones. This is incredible. I mean, I I felt bad 
for the poor unkosher people and the, the, the pig herders and shepherds out there, you know. You can imagine how bad this was for tourism. You're over there, you know, you have your, your shoreline restaurants with amazing seafood, and it is the promised land for a reason. If you've ever been to Israel, their, their vegetables and fruits are ridiculous, right? And, and so imagine these restaurants, they, they're trying to advertise for the sights and the views and the food and the dancing and the music and the culture, but we fail to mention there's this crazy naked man, man screaming and cutting himself in a cemetery. No big deal. <laughs> Just pay him no mind. Nobody can control him anyway. And I love that they have this problem and the problem wasn't getting fixed or resolved. The, the problem, th- there was an issue there that no man could figure out because it wasn't supposed to have a man-made solution. It was supposed to have a Jesus-sized solution. So in verse six, seeing Jesus from a distance, He ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. Isn't it amazing that demons can try to torment us and speak to us and distract us and all these other things, but at the name of Jesus, at the sheer presence of Jesus being there, they bow. And I pray that you have the same confidence and courage that you can walk into any dark place and that what you are bringing just within you, having the presence of God in you, Holy Spirit, that you are bringing something that is more powerful than anything that you will encounter. We have the very presence of God that makes demons tremble at the sheer name. So Jesus came and this this demon had no other choice but to bow down. Verse eight, for he had been saying to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. Some believe that was 2,000 in a legion. Some believe it was as high as 6,000. So as much as 6,000 demons were tormenting this man. Verse 10, and he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And the story goes on that the demons entered and the pigs ended up jumping off of the cliff and killing themselves, which shows us a couple things. It shows us that the demon's intention all along is death. A demon's intention is to take the life that Jesus has given to you away. And the blessing and the encouragement that I see here is that 6,000 demons were not strong enough to end this man's life. They can only distract him and they can only torment him. But one word, the sheer presence of Jesus removed all of that. And that's the same hope that you and I have here today. No matter the magnitude of your issue or circumstance, one word from Jesus can turn it all around. One sheer reflection of his presence and him being there and just knowing that he is there can turn it all the way around. So in your bulletins, a few things about the will of God that we really need to grasp and wrestle with if we want to see his will be done in our lives. If you're taking notes, point number one, and we got to get used to this, there is tension in God's will. There is tension in God's will. So 2 Peter 3.9 says that God desires that all men would come to repentance. God desires. God's will is that everybody gets saved. Now, let me ask you a question. Is everybody getting saved? No. People are dying, rejecting Jesus, which is insane to me because Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. So there are people who have refused Jesus, rejected Jesus, and are going straight to hell with their sins already forgiven. And they simply haven't believed and received. So God has a will, but the crazy thing is sometimes, and we can only see it from this side, sometimes things happen outside of God's will. Some things happen that don't make sense. And these are the things we have to wrestle with. We've been praying for the last couple weeks about little Zoe and and my friend Diego and and Lorena, their poor little fourth grader who just had massive seizures and it just ruined her brain in a coma and for weeks and and it looked like she was going to come out of it and then it took a tank. And a couple days ago, she ended up passing away and going on to be with Jesus. Now, of course, she's in heaven and none of us here can say that's a bad thing and everyone here could say, I'm pretty jealous of the fact that she's in heaven, the place we're all designed to be. And I mean, we're gonna be in heaven 10,000 years down the road and are we even gonna remember this life? 
But at the same time, there's a mom and a dad and an older sister and a community that are devastated. And we have to be the ones to stand here and say, there's a tension. God desired that this little girl would not die, but she died. And we don't understand it. And Jesus doesn't say we have to figure it out, but we still have to live with the tension and not let it affect our faith, not let it affect our courage, not let it affect the, the believing that God can still do it. When you pray for the sick, we have to have the audacity to pray as if we've never failed. We have to have the audacity to pray as if this is the first time we're ever laying hands on the sick. We have to pray for the sick as if we've never seen the sick go unhealed because it's his will. And we may not always understand it, and that is the thing that we wrestle with, but our hearts need to be fully committed. Heard the story of John Wesley, and somebody approached him. He was in town preaching at a bunch of different churches, and he had some dinner reservations with people. And uh, one of the pastors interviewed him at the church and said, if you knew that God was going to take you home in 24 hours, let's say he blessed you with this knowledge, that in 24 hours you would go and be with him in heaven, what would you do right now? He goes, well... I'm preaching at the church tonight at seven, and then I have to go to dinner with so-and-so. Then I'll go to sleep, and I'll wake up at five, and I'll do my time with the Lord as I do each and every morning. I have an 8 a.m. preaching at this so-and-so's church, and then I'm going to be off here doing this. And then by about eight o'clock, I'm set to retire, and, and I will make sure that my heart is in the place to be ready to go home. And so the interviewer said, you wouldn't change anything. You have 24 hours, and you know you're going to die, and you would go about just a normal task. Why, why does that even matter? And John Wesley says it matters because that's what the Lord willed for that day. And my job is to stay in the will of God, regardless of whether I know I will be here or I won't be here. So he says, I could be gone in 24 hours. It doesn't mean that I need to run around and get my affairs in order or, or try to see every family member possible. God willed that I was going to be preaching to these people. And the the sermon I give that day could save many who will be with me in heaven. But he, he longed for the will of God so much that even if he knew he was going to die in a day, he stayed close to the will of God. So we can be encouraged that God knows what he's doing. Even if it doesn't make sense, we can still cling to him. And what encourages me is that I know that whatever situation I am in, God has given me the provision for it. God's will will never take you in a place where his grace can't sustain you. It's the reason why the Israelites walked in the wilderness for 40 years and then go the coastal route. It says in the scriptures that if they went the coastal route, they'd see big giants. They've never been in war and they would run away and give up on the will of God. So he took them a different route to get their hearts ready. He'll always take us in a place where his grace can sustain us. And it's okay to live in the tension. See, faith doesn't deny that the problems exist. Faith doesn't deny that problems exist. If you go to the doctor and they say, I'm so sorry, stage four cancer, that's a fact. That's real. You don't have to say, well, by his stripes, I'm healed, so I reject that doctor and I do not have cancer. Your cells say otherwise, you have cancer. So faith doesn't deny the truth, but what faith does is it denies the influence of those facts. It doesn't let it have a place in your heart. And, and see, John the Baptist, he couldn't do this. John the Baptist couldn't wrestle with the tension of God. John the Baptist was one who baptized Jesus and saw the heavens torn open and the booming voice from heaven and the spirit descend like a dove. He saw this, but then the reality faced him and he's in a prison behind bars awaiting an execution. And now he's saying, are you really Jesus? Are you really the one? Should we expect somebody else? His circumstance and the tension of God's will is for me to be doing this, but I'm stuck in this situation. And he went to his grave, not able to handle the tension and what he faced. And honestly, this is the number one thing that atheists wrestle with, and probably the number one thing why atheists are atheists. If God is so good, why would he let bad things happen? And I don't believe God lets bad things happen. I believe that he let us have a free will, and us dodos sometimes do some really stupid things, some really stupid things. So just because God is silent, let me please encourage us that he's not absent. Just because we think he's silent, just because we think circumstances are bad, doesn't mean that he has a plan all along. And I think many of us have been believers long enough to know that when we thought it was over, when we thought God had abandoned us, at the end and we see the testimony, we're like, wow, I'm glad he was in charge and not me. There was no way I can make these situations line up in the way that they did to bring this outcome. He knows 
what he's doing. But we live, as long as we're alive on earth, we're going to live with the tension, and that's okay. Point number two is that there is truth in God's will. So yes, we live with the tension, but he has given us truth to stand upon that so that we don't rely on our own will, but we can rely on him. Uh, this past couple of weeks, uh, no longer the case, but the last couple of weeks, uh, we were house sitting or, or dog sitting my mom's little Yorkie, little teacup Yorkie, probably about three and a half pounds soaking wet, right? This tiny little dog, little yappy dog, but she was fun. And she was actually so good and so well behaved, she was almost boring. I like really dumb dogs. I don't know if anybody else does. I like dogs that chase their tails. I like dogs that run into things. I like, I like entertainment with puppies, and I like snuggles with dogs. Well, this dog was so good, she was real boring. And uh, one day, she, she started to warm up to us after being in our home about a week. She started warming up and playing with her toys and chasing after stuff and just goofing off like a little dog should. And we introduced a new toy to her, and she really liked it. Problem was, she liked it a little bit too much. So when I tried to reach and get that toy from her, she lunged at me and tried to bite me. She tried to act with this, you know, growling and this hissing. I've never heard a dog hiss before. She's in the corner guarding this, you know, angry at me like she pays bills in this house or something, right? And so she's angry and she will not let this toy go. My mom failed to tell me that she has a habit of doing this. Probably good information to tell somebody who's about to watch your dog. But anyway, that's another matter. So she's in the corner hissing and, you know, that third generation Mexican machismo rises up in me because you don't do that to me in my own house. So I wanted to take that dog and kind of field goal kick it out into the yard and let him fend off the hawks, you know, <laughs> but I'm a Christian and uh, I'm better, better than that. And so I said, okay, so I'm going to go in there and I'm going to take this toy. I, I've had to put dogs in their place. Cesar Milan taught me really well, you know, ks, ks, and then you use the, your hand as the claws and make them submit. So I'm about to go in there and Nikki's like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's, there's, some, there's a, a way we can work around this. And so we spend the next hour, it's 10 o'clock at night. We spend the next hour going through doggy YouTubes, trying to figure out possession tactics and so forth. None of them were working. Distraction, food, treats. She's in the corner. I mean, demonically hissing at me, lunging at me. And I'm like, I'm done with this. I need to take this thing away. So I put on my slip-on uh, dress shoes in my shorts and an oven mitt because I ain't trying to get no stitches over some puny little dog. And I like, listen to me, kid, You're, I'm getting this toy. So I pin her down and she's freaking out and I pull the toy from her. Second I pull the toy from her, she's back to normal, wagging her tail. She's all happy. I'm like, I guess I must have cast out the demon. Who knows, right? <laughs> and so the next night, my son leaves a, a clean sock from switching a load of laundry on the floor because he's a teenager and teenagers just, it's impossible for them to have everything 100% clean. So he leaves a little sock and I see her go into the mudroom with the eyes like newt. I'm like, oh no. So she gets that sock, runs to, and now she's even more demonically filled. I mean, she is, I can't get within 20 feet of this dog and I'm ready to do it again. And Nikki says, no, 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 no. If we take it from her, then she's going to know she'll never get it back and it's only going to get worse. And sure enough, that was the case. And so we looked at another video and we found out that we have to take it from her, make her submit and sit, and then give it back to her. Then take it from her and give it back to her. Take it from her, give it. So she knows it's mine. You can have it sometimes. You can play with it sometimes, but that sock is mine, all right? I don't want no holes in my sock. So we did it, and she, she was, I was able to take it from her. There was one point she's on my lap, and I try to take it. She's like, I'm like, stop it, mine. Sit, you want it? Here. And we did this over and over and over till she finally realized, okay, he's not going to take this from me. I still get to play with this, but it's his. And I share that interesting little story just to vent because you guys are my counselors and therapists, so I have to vent. <laughs> but also to illustrate, is that not so true with our lives? We are not owners of our lives. This life has been given to us by God. And he will let us live and he will bring wonderful blessings into our lives. But at the end of the day, we are his. And we are here on borrowed time from God. Our money is not our money, it's his. Our life is not ours, it's his. Our family is not our family, it's his. And we are stewards of everything that God has given to us. And one of the greatest enemies to the will of God is our own will. 
Because God in his great love said, I'm going to create humans because I desire fellowship, but I'm not going to make them robots. I'm going to give them a free will and they can choose me or not choose me. And that choice can have dire consequences on that planet. Because in somebody's own will, they can walk into a mall and start shooting. In somebody's own will, they can treat their families horrible. But there is this choice that we have. So the greatest enemy to the will of God is our will. I saw a clip from the Reverend Billy Graham from the 70s, and he's sitting there with this long finger and his really cool way that he preaches. And he says that God will never come against your own will. And I had to chew on that. I'm like, I don't, is that theologically correct? I mean, it just seems like we're putting God at bay. It didn't make sense to me, but isn't that amazing that he gave us a choice, that he won't go against our will at times. I mean, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants, but the greatest enemy to God's will in and through our lives is our own will sometimes. And that's why we need truth. That's why this word needs to be on our heart. John 8, 32 says that the truth shall make you free, not set you free. The truth will make you free. And we need to get into a place where though we're surrounded about the facts of this life, where facts are there and cancer diagnosis are there and evil is in this world and things are there. Those are the facts. But the truth says, by his stripes, I'm healed. The truth says that we have a hope in the future. The truth says that he loves us. The truth says that we are forgiven. And that truth needs to be fortified in our hearts. And we can always go to truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 17, Jesus in his great priestly prayer saying, Father, your word is truth. If you can just get to the face of God and get in his word, you will find truth to hide in your heart and be able to stand upon. And with that truth comes point number three is that there is transformation in God's will. There is transformation. So if you can live with the tension of keeping your faith in Jesus and your faith in the Father, even though this world is crazy and there's tension, if you can keep truth hidden in your heart, what's going to end up happening is that you are completely transformed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. There's a transformation that happened. The old is gone. Your dead man has been buried, resurrected in Jesus. You are a new creation. You are a child of God, filled with grace, completely set apart. And then in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, we all know this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and know what God's will is. To see clearly the will of God for your life, you need to have a mind that is transformed. And that comes by renewing your mind, keeping your mind steady on the word of God. When we teach our children how to do this, we say, take the bad thoughts and take the lies, crumple them up and throw them in the trash. Crumple them up and throw them in the trash. You're going to be 99 years old, still like, woof, crumple that up, throw it in the trash. Crumple that up, throw it in the trash. Keeping your mind and your heart stayed on him. Constantly renewing your mind to truth. I love how Ephesians chapter 4 says it. It says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That means holy, through and through, completely his. And I'll just end with, with this, testimonies that many of us already know. If you're new to our flock, maybe you, you do not know this, but my family and I, we've been through the ringer in church ministry. When Nikki and I first uh, started dating, I was at a mega church of 5,000 people, and I was there for seven years. And then they ran out of money in the church and decided they didn't need a youth pastor anymore. So being married to Nikki Having a three-month-old kid, we had no job in a one-bedroom apartment next to a liquor store on the wrong side of the tracks. I said, God, I don't know why this happened. I don't know. We had 160 high school kids whose lives were transforming, literal drug dealers and, and robbers who were 15 years old were giving their lives to Jesus and cleaning up their lives. Why would you make this end, God? And then we ended up, through a miracle, going to an Assemblies of God church. I was with a non-denominational church. But we ended up going to a Assemblies of God Pentecostal church. We served there for 11 years. And it was there that I was able to raise up my son. It was there my, my wife and I built our marriage on the truth of the power of the Spirit of God. And we were exposed and, and welcomed and learned and grew to so many incredible truths that we would not have had we not left that mega church. It all made sense to me. But then 11 years down the road in 2017, the senior pastor was getting ready to retire. I was supposed to take over as pastor in the city I grew up in. I went to the elementary school across the street. I went to the middle school. I graduated the city's high school, and I was supposed to take over that pulpit. But he fell into moral sin. The church fell apart. It went from 1,300 people to 300 people. And who got laid off? Me. What did I do wrong? Nothing. 
Why was that happening? Because his son-in-law was on staff and this pastor who was about to get fired from the denomination wanted his son-in-law to take over and not me. So there I am living in an RV, $20 to my name, just my wife, my son, and I trying to figure out where are we, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? We ended up planting a church, and for 18 months, it was marvelous. Our closest friends, 18 months, we ran that ministry, grew to about 100 people, but then I couldn't do it. Two full-time jobs, Nikki's bout with depression. It wasn't working. California's prices were going through the roof, and we just couldn't do it anymore, and we felt God pulling us to Texas, and so finally, I shut that church down, ruined people's lives, crushed people's hearts. I don't know if you know or have ever done where you've had to shut down a business or close the doors to something that people's lives, blood, sweat, and tears were a part of, I shattered hearts. And that's the responsibility and the burden I have as a leader. And, and to this day, there's still some four or five years later that have not found a church home. And I live with that every single day. And so coming to Texas, I'm like, God, why, why, why couldn't I just be a senior pastor in the city I grew up in? Why didn't it work out? It, it never made sense to me. Now we're living in an RV. We're in Houston. I'm working as a janitor trying to find some type of a job. It's not making sense. God, did I make the right decision? And then COVID hits. I said, oh, I definitely made the right decision. I'm thankful that I followed God because can you imagine in California how locked down it was trying to have a church plant and raise a family and pay the bills when you couldn't even hold a church service? I said, God, you spared me. If it was just for me and my family, thank you that you spared us and, and allowed us to be here. And we ended up coming to North Texas at, a, at of all places, a Methodist church. And I've always been Pentecostal at heart and so forth and never been in that crazy world of Methodists where they have a committee for everything. And it's just very interesting. And we were there for 18 months. And originally I said no to this job. I said, God, I'm not feeling it. I have zero peace. But then they offered us a free 3,000 square foot remodeled home rent-free. They offered a $10,000 a year private school Christian tuition to my son. I said, how can I say no to that? And so I ended up taking a job as a youth pastor associate, and we were there for 18 months, and inside I felt like I was dying slowly because I felt like I sold out. What a sellout. You knew that God said no to this job. You didn't feel any peace to it, and because they presented you this awesome package, you took it. What a sellout. And I live with that, and that church had a lot of liberal thoughts and pro-abortion and pro-gay rights. And it was just divided in that church. And, and every day I'm like, I'm serving here, I'm preaching here, and I don't even agree with half of the people here. Or all, and it was killing me inside. So finally, January 15th, 2020, before COVID struck, and I'm sitting there at a Bishop Arts in Dallas at a little cafe in front of Pastor Josh, who is our area pastor in Waxahachie. And I pour my guts out to him and share my story. And he's telling me why you want to be in Foursquare and graduated the university. And all I've ever wanted to be was a Foursquare pastor, yada, yada. And he goes, okay, we're finishing up our meal. He goes, you know, Duncanville is looking for a pastor. And about a month later, I was hired. I'm like, why, God, did you bring me to a Methodist church? Why, God, was I in an RV? Why, God, did I plant a church and have to leave? He knows what he's doing. And this is one of a thousand stories in my life where I reflect and say, God, you knew what you were doing. And I'm only 38, so I know there's going to be a whole lot more stories where I'm going to freak out. But at the end, I'm going to say, God, you knew what you were doing. And family, the same is for us. So my, my plea this morning is don't just obey God because you feel like you have to. Yes, that's what we need to do. But don't do it in a sense of obligation. I have to do the will of God in your lives because it is your strength. It is your comfort. He knows what he's doing. And you can bypass the craziness of this world. And when it doesn't make sense to say, I trust you. You've done it before. You'll do it again. I saw your plan unfold. You'll do it again. And we can put our full faith in him. So Father, we thank you for your goodness here this morning. And thank you, God, that there is a story to be written in every family that is here, those who are watching. Thank you that you have given us a hope and a future. Thank you that you have not left us as orphans. Thank you that, Holy Spirit, you are our guide, our wisdom, our comfort, our teacher, our companion. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given us grace. You have given us mercy that we're going to mess up so many times in this life, but it does not change who we are as a child of God. And we can, with all abandon, give our everything to you, God. And so I pray for my family here and God, just for our friends watching online, that you would help us to realize what a blessing your will is, how you have it all figured out, you have it fully under control, you are in charge of it all, and help us 
when it doesn't line up, it doesn't make sense, it seems contrary to believe, to trust, and to still have faith according to your word. So bless my friends here, and as we begin a new week, Father, I pray we be just rejuvenated in your presence. May we go in your supernatural joy and in your strength. We love you today, God, and we thank you for this time of being in the corporate gathering place to worship and study the word of God together. May you bless my friends and thank you for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You have a great and a wonderful week. And if there's a need for prayer, we'll have some wonderful people here who would love to pray for you. God bless you, family. Have a great week.